Good morning. It's great to have you with us today. Live in New York City, I'm Evelyn Lee, and this is NTD's special coverage of the Falun Dafa Day celebration in New York. Falun Dafa is also known as Falun Gong, and it originated in China, and in just a few decades, it's spread all across the world in over 100 countries, and it's now being practiced by millions. But it's also a group that's been severely persecuted in China since the late 90s. And we will be digging deeper into some of those issues in a little bit. And to give us some more insight about Falun Gong and what's happening in China, we invited a very special guest. Joining me in the studio is Ben Maloney from the Falun Dafa Information Center. It's great to see you, Ben. Yeah, Evelyn, thanks for having me. Great to be here. Of course. Um, I want to back up for a moment, though. And before we start this whole live, uh, why don't you tell us first what exactly is being celebrated and you as a Falun Gong practitioner yourself, what exactly is Falun Dafa? Yeah, I think the easiest way to understand it is that Falun Gong is an ancient spiritual practice from China that was introduced to the public in 1992 and includes two parts. So one part is exercises, so slow moving Qigong type exercises with a sitting meditation. And the second part is sort of a spiritual teaching that's based on truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. So those are things that practitioners try to incorporate in their daily lives. I see, very interesting. Um, I want to look at the live stream for a moment, and it looks like we are seeing a bunch of cutouts of what is the Zhuan Falun, is that correct? And that's the main scripture of, the, um, of Falun Gong. So why don't you explain a little bit more about that? And because we see, you know, all the, I see a lot of different languages. I see Chinese, obviously, there's English, there's Hebrew, there's Arabic. Um, how come for, you know, it just makes me wonder, for something that's essentially based on Chinese philosophy, how come all these people across the world, you know, from different backgrounds, cultural backgrounds, um, are so receptive to that? Yeah, I mean, th to back up for a second, so Zhuang Falun is the main text of Falun Gong that's based on the lectures that Master Li Hongzhi gave in China during 1992 to 1994. Gave about nine lectures, so you have nine chapters made into Zhuang Falun. It's been translated and people are practicing in over 100 countries. Uh, you know, when you look at the tenets of Falun Gong, truthfulness, compassion, tolerance, that translates into every language. You know, those, those beliefs I think everyone can agree are great. And so Falun Gong really, although it originated in China, is something that's quite universal and the principles and practice are very universal. Interesting. And um, for this event today, uh, this is World Falun Dafa Day for those who are tuning in right now. And this Friday, May 13th, also marks a special day. It is the 30th anniversary of the founding of Falun Gong. So every year around this time, tens of thousands of people across the globe come together to celebrate that. But this year, with everything still recovering from COVID, it's a bit smaller. But still, the organizer, uh, organizers expect a couple of thousand participants. So for this event today, we will be following their parade across New York City. So why don't we take a quick look at the route today? The parade will be starting off in the United Nations Plaza. It will be going down 2nd Avenue until it reaches 42nd Street. And then from there, the parade will be cutting through Midtown Manhattan. And then it will be passing famous landmarks like the Chrysler Building, the New York Public, Li Public Library, Bryant Park, and Times Square. And from there, we'll keep going all the way to the other side of Manhattan, where the Chinese consulate is located. And let's take a look at the current parade. We see all these people holding um, banners that read Falun Dafa is wonderful. I see three Chinese characters that read Zhen Shan Ren. And uh, that's roughly translated into honesty, truthfulness, and compa or compassion, and tolerance. So what is the significance of that? Yeah, so in, in Falun Gong, those are s sort of the main tenets of the practice. So you had to sum up the practice in three words. Those would be the words that you'd use. And of course, they have deeper layers of meaning and you know how it incorporates. But you know, it's more about, OK, how can I be more of an honest person? Hey, in this scenario, could I have a little bit more tolerance? Or maybe I could be a little bit more compassionate, right? I think that's, for me, that's kind of what I try to do every day. So that's kind of how it incorporates into everyday life. I see. Um, what we unfortunately missed just now, there was a Tianguo marching band, the marching band having the opening. And it's a band that is represented all over the world um, with, with hundreds of members. And I did some research. 
Before COVID, just the band alone was actually 600 members strong. Um, and they're playing original compositions like Falun Dafa is Good or American classics like Stars and Stripes Forever. And all of these people in that band are all volunteers that put their free time into practice. And we want to take this opportunity really quick and hear from the conductor of that band, um, who is with our infield reporter, Chenny Wu, right now. So, Chenny. Thanks, Evelyn. Sterling, you've performed with David Bowie and Duran Duran, to name a few. But how is it managing such a big group of people and preparing for such a big event? Um, well, from being in the music business so long, I've also watched how people prepared because we're also dealing with a large group when you're setting up for a tour. So I learned a few tricks of, I mean, sometimes I have to um, improvise because all the settings are always different. But I just, I don't know, I used all the things I've learned from being in the music business on, on uh, organizing things. So why are you willing to use your free time on this specific type of thing? Well, um, one, I've been practicing Falun Gong for uh, 24 years and just have a, I mean, this is, I think, is a very important event because we're constantly, one, spreading Falun Dafa, but also spreading about the, uh, the persecution of Falun Dafa, and uh, it's become like an annual event for us. And, uh, you know, I could, I'm more than happy to, to be a part of this. Um, what is your experience practicing Falun Dafa? What benefits have you gotten? A lot of uh, self-reflection, you know, really trying to do right <laughs> as opposed to wrong, which I've, in my past, I, I went down a lot of wrong paths. and. Uh, um, it's just trying to correct me on, on the right path and uh, also my, uh, you know, I, I dealt with a lot of addictions in the past and I was able to like overcome uh, alcohol and cigarettes and drugs. Could you tell me a bit more about that? Yeah, I mean, um, pre-practicing pre Falun Dafa, I mean, I had a two-pack-a-day two cigarette habit. I smoked pot, I drank alcohol, like, without even thinking about it, like, on pretty much every day. And uh, post, I mean, pr about two or three weeks when I started practicing, all of that went away. Just like that? And, yeah, and that's, that's 24 years ago. Wow, okay. Thank you, Sterling. Back to you, Evelyn. Thank you very much, Chenny. It looks like we caught up with the marching band, so let's not miss, miss this grand opening again. Let's take a listen. marching band. The one we're seeing right now is just the U.S. band, but they're also represented all over the world. There is a Canadian one, there is a European one, and I know there is also a Taiwanese one, but that's just to name a few. Um, like I had just mentioned, before COVID, before COVID restrictions, um, that was roughly two years ago, the band itself was 600 members strong. And um, I think what we just heard is original composition. Ben, do you know which song we just listened to? That was Falun Dafa Hao, which means Falun Dafa is good. 
There um, you go. <laughs> which, which is really important. Like, it seems simple to say in the U.S., like, Falun Dafa is good. But in China, it's actually, like, very powerful for people to say that. So that term has a lot of, carries a lot of meaning in China because, of course, it's been outlawed in the persecution. So when people say that in China, it's like a... It's like, sta- it's like a big thing, you know, I it's see. very brave. Like a brave statement. Very brave. And yeah. I definitely want to touch on that more later, um, but uh, back to the Tiangua marching band. On its website, the name Tiangua actually translates to celestial, and that reflects the band's spiritual origins. So translated into English, that's celestial marching band. Now, Ben, I know in traditional Chinese culture, spirituality is something that was very important, but nowadays that's something that the communist regime heavily controls and even persecutes. But tell me more about faith in traditional Chinese culture and how it has changed today. Yeah, I think if if we take Western culture as an example, like the U.S., based on kind of Judeo-Christian values originally, China is based around Confucianism, Taoism, and Buddhism. So those are kind of the traditional values that ran through all the dynasties. So we're talking 5,000 years of culture. Even emperors paid respects to the heavens. So it's, it's a very deep fabric of Chinese life and Chinese society to have this reverence and have a spirituality. Uh, But that was all obviously destroyed or attempted to be destroyed during the Cultural Revolution and when communism took over because of course they are atheist. So they don't, you know, they're the highest in their minds, right? So that that kind of uh, is what kind of destroyed Chinese culture, traditional Chinese culture in China. And despite that, Falun Gong actually spread rapidly across the world and in China, as I understand. And talking about this, we also have our reporter Chenny Wu on site today. She's joined by a Falun Gong practitioner right now who will share a bit more about his experiences. Thanks, Evelyn. Here with me today is Olivier Chaton. He's a Falun Gong practitioner participating in this year's Falun Dafa Day Parade. So, Olivier, can you tell me what is the greatest value that practicing Falun Dafa has given you? Well, I think um, I, I think one one of the greatest value is really uh, some some moral values, uh, the three values: uh, authenticity, uh, compassion, and forbearance. I think these are. Really, for me, it's like a lighthouse in my daily life because the society is not necessarily promoting. Society is, is often promoting, uh, um, uh, you know, instant gratification and, uh, and short-term pleasure. But there's, there's, for me, there's more to life, uh, and it gives me a very solid ground to, to, um, to reach peace of heart and mind. So, how did you hear about the practice in the first place? I was practicing Kung Fu martial arts, Chinese martial arts, when I was uh, 18, so like 25 years ago. And then one of my friends who uh, was practicing with me, you know, I was a bit disappointed because my expectation for martial arts was that they were also bringing moral values to the table and it was a way of life. But uh, at least here in the West, it's not thought like that. And I think even in Asia, it's, it's difficult to find a, tr- a true authentic school. But um, I was looking for something with really uh, deep moral values, and my friend uh, found, uh, you know, it was 1997, found on, on internet. At that time, nobody had internet beside him. And so he found on internet this Qigong that he was telling me, oh, I think you will be very moved by their philosophy. So, um, so then I started to read, and I just, you know, knew I would practice this. So what exactly prompted you to pick it up? It's not really... Um, it's, it's, it's not really like a decision per se or, or prompt me to pick it up. It's more, uh, you know, sometimes in, in life you meet people that you know you, will, you have a certain connection or you, you know you, you will, you know, do a part of your journey with. Um, so Falun Dafa was really like that. It was just like f- when I read the book, I felt home. I felt that what it was taught in Falun Dafa was exactly what I believed deep down inside from my childhood, but that society was not encourage me and bolding me to, uh, to, to promote or, or, or abide by. So I felt a, a very strong connection. So it was very natural. It was not a, uh, a logical decision. It was just knowing that this is what I was looking for. Olivier, thanks for sharing. Evelyn, back to you. Thank you, Chenny, and welcome back. For everyone that's joining us right now, this is the live coverage of the World Falun Dafa Des- celebration in the heart of New York City. And we just heard some personal experience from a Falun Gong practitioner. Ben, I'm interested, how did you get into Falun Gong? Yeah, it was, it was interesting to hear uh, his experience and Sterling's experience. Uh, for me, um, I was 20 when I was introduced to Falun Gong in college. 
I mean, a little backstory. Like, I was a pretty hyperactive kid when I was young. And so in the West, sometimes they medicate you for that. So I remember second grade, they gave me Ritalin, and I was taking kind of that throughout my life for ADHD. And then later, I kind of got into drinking and partying uh, when I got a little bit older and, um, and was taking antidepressants. So, like, you know, I, I grew up in a great place and great education and was going to a great college, but I was, you know, a little bit, had a lot of these kind of issues I couldn't figure out. And uh, I, I didn't have, like, I didn't know anything about meditation. And my cousin's like, hey, I started pra practicing this thing, and why don't you try it out? And so I remember when he introduced me to the sitting meditation, we went and kind of did it. I was a little reluctant, and I felt like, like a, like a weight was lifted off my shoulders when I was doing the meditation. I just felt very light and like peaceful. And I'm like, what is this? You know, what is this feeling? So you went from having ADHD to meditation for how long? Yeah, now I've been practicing about 15 years. And yeah, if I'm, if I want to be, you know, if I want to brag a little, uh, you know, then I do about an hour, you know, an hour to two hours of meditation a day. Um, and I'll sit in meditation, like the sitting meditation uh, for, for an hour. In Falun Gong, it's an hour meditation. But that took me a really long time. Right. Yeah. That, did, that wasn't overnight. It starts at five minutes, 10 minutes, 15. But, you know, an amazing thing starts to happen. You know, for me, like right after I started practicing Falun Gong, it was like, what is this thing, right? Coming from the West, you feel like, it, like where's the temple? Like, do I need to pay someone? Like, do I go to a class? Like, what, like what's the structure here? And Falun Gong's not like that at all. It's like you go to the park and some people are practicing. They go home. You go and maybe you study with some people. Then you go home. If you show up, okay. If you don't show up, no big deal. Nobody takes your name. Nobody's ever asked me for money in 15 years. So it was very different. I and mean, when I started practicing, you know, like it gave me, it gave me kind of a lot of principles to live my life by that, that I didn't have before. And what ended up happening very shortly after that is like the desire to drink went away. I mean, very similar to what Sterling said. I didn't need antidepressants. I didn't need, you know, the ADHD medication, which they give you so you can concentrate and study. And I ended up graduating with honors from a, a top college in the U.S. without that, you know? So it's amazing kind of the benefits meditation can give you that, you know, you can do it that way as well. And I imagine that, well, you actually mentioned it, it's quite a journey. You went from five minutes um, going back to meditation to 10 minutes. So would you say, you know, I imagine it takes a long journey to actually reach that peace of mind. Would you say with that, a lot of you in you has changed? Yeah, I think if you talk to people that, that knew me, even, you know, uh, you know, that's the beauty of Falun Gong. The Falun Gong teaches practitioners to think about other people before themselves and to also look what practitioners might call look inward. So look at myself in all these instances. So when there's a conflict or there's an issue, how can I improve? So that whole framework is different. That has changed me completely. And I can, I didn't think people changed before. I thought people are just who they are. They stay that way and that's it. And Falun Gong has taught me, no, I can become more truthful. I can become kinder. I can become more compassionate, but that's a definite work in progress. I mean, you can ask my wife, it's definitely a work in progress. <laughs> Well, but still, it sounds it's, it's, it's an inspiration. Great. Um, let's take a look at what is going on in the city at the moment at the parade. We see the next group that is slowly moving towards us, and it looks like they are people that demonstrate these slow-moving exercises. And I think those of you who have been in China will probably know about um, these kind of people exercising in parks. Um, I've seen people practice Qigong in parks and doing Tai Chi. My dad used to do Tai Chi there. But Ben, for these Falun Gong exercises, how can they be compared to that? Yeah, so obviously, like we talked about, China has a long spiritual foundation. So some of these practices started coming out in the 80s, Tai Chi, you know, and, and other Qigong. Falun Gong differs a little in its moral component. But as far as like learning it, like you could be nine years old or 90 years old. I've seen both. I've seen five-year-olds sitting in meditation. So it's very easy to learn. It's not, it's not hard. As you can see, it's slow moving. So you can compare it to those in terms of how easy it is to learn. I see. And um, for everybody that's tuning in right now, you're watching the 2022 uh, Falun Dafa Day. This is the live coverage of that. And today is the 30th anniversary of the founding of Falun Gong. So we see thousands of thousands of people walking towards the Chinese consulate. Um, that's because these people are not only celebrating this anniversary, but also calling for an end to the atrocities and the horrible persecution that is currently going on in China. 
And I think if we take a closer look, we will see um, soon, right now we see beautiful women dancing in lotus costumes. Um, and then soon we will be seeing a second section of today's parade that will be coming toward us. And um, these people are dressed in white. The reason for that is because in Chinese culture, the color white is for mourning. So um, this group will basically be remembering Falun Gong practitioners that died or was, were tortured to death because they didn't want to give up their faith. And I'm just wondering, um, despite of all these things that are happening in China, you see all these people out on the streets, why do people still do not let go of their faith? Why do they, do they still continue? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's like outside of China, obviously it's a non-issue in terms of like I can go to the park and sit down in meditation and nobody's coming in a van to throw me in it and throw me in an underground prison. You know, when you when you look at China, and hopefully we can get into kind of the origins of that later so people have context, but, you know, the Chinese Communist Party wants to destroy, they want to control everything about you. They want to control society. They want to control your mind. Like, it's, it's, it's a very kind of, for lack of a better term, evil way to control society. But belief in something higher than yourself, in divine, in God, in heaven, that's something that exists somewhere that the Communist Party can't touch. And so that, that, that for people that hold on to that, that, it's because they got so much benefit from it, right? I mean, I just told you my benefits. You heard from Sterling and another practitioner, their benefits. It's, it's, it's hard to go against that, right? Why would you give that up when you've gotten so much from it? Absolutely. And um, for those, for the audience members that just tuned in into the show, you are a Falun Gong practitioner yourself. So why don't you tell us more about why you chose to practice Falun Gong and how you basically got into that? Yeah, I mean, we touched on it a little bit earlier yes. on the, so, some of it. But I mean, for me, for me, I would have been the last person you would think, really. Like, I was like, if you had a, if you had a, like a, a really bad movie, of an American college kid doing very stupid things, like I could, I could have starred in that movie. And so to do a complete 180, right, and to stop drinking, to, to live this kind of, this, this life that where I'm thinking about others and not being selfish and not having this hot temper. I mean, it, my parents were shocked. My, you know, my brother was shocked. My friends were shocked. It, so they really saw a difference. Like night and day, <laughs> night and day. I mean, you couldn't, you could, you would have thought it was like, yeah, it would have been like a movie, right? Where it's just like in, a, in, a, in an instant, I go in a room, I come out of the room. I mean, this took time, right? It takes time to change, but Falun Gong gave me kind of the toolkit, I'd say, to figure out, hey, how can I, how can I be a better person here? And I wanted that, I just, I didn't have a way to do it before. I see. And again, for those um, who missed the beginning part, um, in your words, what is Falun Gong? Yeah, Falun Gong, very simply, is an ancient uh, spiritual practice that originated in China. Um, that involves five sets of exercises, a sitting meditation and four standing exercises, similar to Qigong or Tai Chi, and an also a moral component which centers around truthfulness, compassion, and tolerance. So those are the three principles at the core of Falun Gong, and that's what practitioners try to live by every day. I see. And let's take a look at what's going on in the streets of New York City right now. We see the three characters that you just mentioned uh, walking towards us. Um, it was said, Jin, Shan, and Ren, that's a Chinese translation to truthfulness, um, compassion, and tolerance. Um, and we see many people dressed in yellow. Uh, they, these are actually all Falun Gong practitioners, believe it or not. And we have uh, the organizers telling us that they expect thousands and thousands of people coming out on the streets because they want to march towards um, the Chinese embassy to call for an end to the persecution in China. But not only that, today is also a very special day because it's the 30th anniversary of the founding of Falun Gong. So today is also 20, the 2022 World Falun Dafa Day. That's why people are out on the streets and celebrating. Um, Do you, like one interesting thing, I don't know if we have time, I think it's important for Westerners because sometimes they get a misconception here. If you look at the banners, uh, they're seeing the banners on screen, there's yes. a little emblem Yes. There's a little emblem that's kind of the symbol of Falun Dafa, and it has in it what you might call a Srivatsa symbol or the Wanza symbol, or in the West, people refer to it as a swastika. And so this symbol actually, it's very ancient. You see it on ancient Buddhist statues. You see it in paintings. You see it in museums. You can see it on like wall. It's thousands of years old, and it's kind of the symbol of a Buddha. 
But yes. what? But obviously, Adolf Hitler <laughs> appropriated right. that symbol. So when Westerners see the symbol of Falun Dafa, it can be very. Uh, they don't understand, right? Because they're like, "Whoa, that's that symbol in the West is." you know, it means a certain thing, but it's very important that that was misappropriated and this is an ancient symbol that has existed for a long time. So I just wanted to clarify that in case people are seeing it for the first time Absolutely, and they, they don't yes. know what it is. Okay, um, so that was important to mention. And um, if you believe it or not, this Buddhist practice, is that right to call it a Buddhist practice? Yeah, a Buddhist school. Yeah, okay. it's not Buddhism religion, but yeah, right. sure. That's okay. a way to understand This it. Buddhist practice has been a along for around for 30 years now and this is a celebration of that but if you believe it or not this is actually being heavily persecuted in China and we I'm hearing that soon we will be seeing the second section which is um, people that are raising awareness about these atrocities that are currently going on in China and um, I just want to Here, um, so the day that this happened was actually July 20th, 1999. Sorry, I need to get my facts straight about that. Um, it's the day when this crackdown on Falun Gong practitioners started. And I want to know how this happened. So let's watch a video about that today. In 1998, the Chinese government estimated that between 70 and 100 million people in China were practicing Falun Gong. It was the most popular practice of its kind in Chinese history, but the leader of the Communist Party wanted it gone. In the early hours of July 20th, 1999, public security bureaus carried out an organized operation to arrest the volunteer coordinators of Falun Gong practice sites throughout China. This was ordered by then Chinese leader Jiang Zemin. He declared that Falun Gong should be eliminated within three months. When his campaign failed to stop Falun Gong, he simply cracked down harder. Zhang Zemin implemented a strategy to eradicate Falun Gong practitioners by ruining their reputations, crushing them financially, and eliminating them physically. He also declared that beating them to death counts as suicide. From 1999 to the present, the Falun Gong website Minghui.org has verified at least 4,700 cases of Falun Gong practitioners being persecuted to death but some estimates suggest the true number of practitioners killed is actually several hundred thousand. In response to 23 years of brutal repression, Falun Gong practitioners inside and outside China have been unyielding in their efforts to expose the persecution through peaceful activities. And ever since then, there have been horrifying images and stories coming out of China. And there is this woman, please be aware that this is going to be a graphic image, but there is this woman, she's quite well known in those circles that deal with human rights. Some of you may have may be able to catch her in one of those banners. Um, her name is Gao Rongrong. There you go, there you see her. Um, ben, what is her story? Is she still alive? Yeah, wow. Um, so. Gao Rong Rong was a Falun Gong practitioner, and in 1999, she was uh, accounted at an art college, and she lost her job. That's common for millions of practitioners. They got fired when the persecution started, um, and she was in prison. Um, and when she was in prison, in you know, they torture you, and they torture you uh, to give up your belief. Uh, that's all they want. They want to break you. It doesn't have any real meaning other than to break you. And so one of the torture methods they commonly use is uh, with electric batons, and electric batons are like uh, like a taser times a thousand. And so the images you just saw are are because guards tased her face with those electric batons. And you know, I, I've met people that have that have had this torture done to them, and it's it's excruciating, like unbearable. And so what ended up happening is she she had this torture uh, uh, to her. You saw the images, and um, she she was sent to the hospital because she tried to escape the prison by jumping out the window and. They sent her to the hospital after that, and her sister snuck in and took a picture of her. And this was uh, in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004. And that picture got to the UN, and that was published in a report in 2003 or four, I believe, from the UN, and that went kind of viral, because it was the first time people saw, because the CCP has an iron fist on everything happening, so people didn't know how bad it was, and they saw this picture. And so what ended up happening is, because this picture went so viral of Gao Rong Rong, the Chinese Communist Party was furious and they sent her to a very infamous place called Masanja Labor Camp. And Masanja Labor Camp is like the, 
it's it's one of the worst places you could ever imagine. Um, and in 2005, uh, she was killed there. Wow. Yeah. So she died at the age of 37 years old for believing in truthfulness, compassion, tolerance, and practicing meditation. That's absolutely horrible. And um, but I think that's also a story of incredible courage and inspiration. Unfortunately, um, what Ben just told us about, we cannot show videos and the photos um, right here. But you can go to followinfo.org and net. followinfo.net. Sorry about that. Yeah, okay, yeah. good. Followinfo.net to find it there and take a look and see what Gao Rongrong actually had to say about her persecution herself. And if you're just tuning in, this is a special coverage of the World Falun Dafa Day celebration in New York. We're following the parade that is marching through Manhattan, and we're seeing thousands of people still marching towards the Chinese consulate to call for an end to the persecution on Falun Gong adherence. And our reporter Chenny Wu is somewhere in the crowd at the moment, and she's joined by Simon Zhang, who lost his mother to the persecution in China. Chenny, please tell us more. Thanks, Evelyn. Here with me is Simon Zhang, whose mother was taken away to the labor camps for practicing Falun Dafa. Simon, can you tell me a bit about what happened? So the first time, that was uh, back in 2001, I was at home. I saw my mom taken away by local police. They ransacked the whole apartment, found out materials like Falun Gong books, uh, materials like uh, stickers that, and uh, flyers. They used that as an excuse, giving no reason they took her away. What happened after she was taken away that time? She was beaten horribly in the local detention center, then sent to a labor camp, almost died there after torture there. Wait, but how old was she at that time? That was in 2001, so she was 44 years old. Oh, wow. So she was already pretty old, and yet they treated her like that. Right. Um, so, can you tell me a bit about what happened later? The second occasion that was in 2008, before the Summer Olympics in Beijing, she was taken away again. For similar reason, similar happened, similar thing happened, tortured, then sent to a remote labor camp, almost died there again. How about the last time? So, last time was the third time, and she did not escape death. Uh, February 1st, that was Chinese New Year, they took her, took her away. Simply, a sim similar thing for believing in truthfulness, compassion, forbearance, and not giving up, for distributing flyers and clarifying truth to normal people. Then she take, they took her away, tortured ser seriously. Then they, because she was uh, lost, she lost her consciousness, they sent her to hospital. And her last uh, 37 days was uh, spent in hospital, being handcuffed to bed, iron fetters on ankles and rubber, rubber tube in nose, then died there. I'm so sorry, Simon. Yeah, it's a, it's a really terrible memory for my entire family and me. Simon, thanks for sharing your story. Evelyn, back to you. How horrible for a child to having to go through something like this. Um, but one thing that's incredible is that the CCP did actually promote Falun Gong in its early days. And interestingly enough, there are old news packages from state-run TV stations that prove just that. So let's take a look at one of them.接下来请收看两条本市体育简讯今天一大早上海体育中心人头传动本市近万名爱好法轮大法的练功者汇聚一处进行推广表演法轮大法创始人李洪志师傅于九二年向社会公开传功讲法受到广大群众的欢迎六
Well, well, first I just got a comment. I love those uh, old news broadcasts. You know, you, you see the nature of the Chinese Communist Party because they're like, oh, yes, because of the party pushing these uh, initiatives forward, they, they take credit uh, for anything. But so, yeah, why, why the big shift a, a year later? Uh, the real reason is uh, the leader of China at the Chinese Communist Party at the time, Jiang Zemin, uh, was a very weak leader. Uh, he, and he had really, he came into power because of the Tiananmen Square massacre. So he knew that in order to preserve his position, to not end up getting purged himself, he needed an enemy to fight against. And for him, that was Falun Gong. So am I understanding correctly that Falun Gong practitioners, Jiang Zemin, the former head of the Communist Party, he needed a fall guy to come to power and that was Falun Gong? Basically, I mean, you saw him, uh, he had a lot of connections in state-run media, and he was trying to use that to begin, you know, giving Falun Gong a bad reputation before, well before 1999, when the persecution officially began. But what really did it was uh, in, in 1999, uh, you know, Falun Gong practitioners came to Beijing to protest for their rights to, not even protest, to just appeal to the government for their right to practice something supposedly guaranteed by the Chinese constitution. But this happened April 1999, 10 years to the month that the Tiananmen protests began, the Tiananmen protests that led to the Tiananmen Square massacre. Uh, and so this sent shockwaves throughout the party. It was a significant anniversary. There were, uh, by the government's own estimates, 100 million people practicing Falun Gong. This made people in the Communist Party nervous, and Jiang Zemin took advantage of that to say, oh, look, this, this group of people, you know, they've infiltrated all levels of society, even the highest levels of the Communist Party. The only way to stop them from taking over is, you know, if you give me total power, let me start uh, like a Gestapo-like secretive organization that has total power and answers only to me or somebody appointed by me. Right, and you touched on a very interesting point there, because China has a national budget for maintaining social stability. And in its height, the number of that uh, was in the trillions, even if you uh, convert it into U.S. dollars. So first of all, what does that even mean, um, social stability? And can you please tell me more about that enormous budget? So what a lot of people may not realize is that China spends more on, its, on policing the Chinese people than it does on its military. Uh, that shows you where its priorities are. This really expanded uh, under Jiang Zemin and his successors, uh, using the excuse of going after Falun Gong practitioners. But essentially, they were able to create this massive surveillance system, this massive network of secret police, internal police, uh, black jails, this whole system to just really keep an iron grip over Chinese society. And the Chinese regime, you said that before, had established the so-called 610 office. And basically, people like you just did refer to the Chinese Gestapo. And its sole purpose is to crack down on Falun Gong adherence. But why does the CCP consider you know, Falun Gong in particular as such a threat? You know, I think it was the Communist Party has always operated by having an enemy to struggle against. Uh, Dojung is the word for struggle. It's 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 this really horrible, dangerous uh, thing. They it's a word that they used against the Tiananmen protesters in 1989 that they had to Dojung. They had to struggle against them. This has been used throughout the Communist Party's history. Falun Gong, a hundred million people practicing. Um, it was just a, a group of people that. You know, they weren't even against the party. A lot of them considered that a lot of them were in the party. But it was just a convenient tool for Jiang Zemin to use to cement his power and ensure that uh, people who were loyal to him were promoted through the ranks because they were involved in the persecution. It became like this political litmus test. Like, oh, are you uh, all gung-ho for the persecution of Falun Gong? Then you're getting promoted. Wow. But what do you think personally has to happen to stop the persecution on Falun Gong and obviously all the other groups as well? Well, people around the world need to realize that the Chinese Communist Party, it's, it's a gangster regime. It's, it's, you know, it's communist. It's, it doesn't support human rights. It's not going to change. Uh, you know, people think now that it might be, you know, it's, it's Xi Jinping who is the problem now. It's, it's the Communist Party itself that is, you know, a criminal organization. And until the rest of the world realizes, like, this is not 
a regime we can legitimately uh, do business with. Like China uses rape as a form of torture. This is not a regime we should be having dialogue with or working together to combat climate change or, uh, you know, doing big business with. We, we need to recognize the Chinese Communist Party for what it is. Right. Uh, thank you so much for these eye-opening insights. Chris Chappell, host of China Uncensored. Thanks. And for everyone just tuning in, this is the 2022 live coverage of the F World Falun Dafa Day. Today, Falun Dafa, or more, more commonly known as Falun Gong, is being severely persecuted in China. And by 1999, when the persecution first started, China estimated that there were around 100 million people that practiced Falun Gong. And when Jiang Zemin, that's a former head of the Chinese Communist Party, ordered to eradicate Falun Gong, it was a big operation to make that possible, so they created the 610 office especially for that. So let's watch a short clip about what that is. On June 10, 1999, the leader of the Chinese Communist Party created a group for handling the Falun Gong problem. That group created what came to be known as the 610 office, named for the date of its establishment. Since then, the 610 office has overseen China's nationwide persecution of Falun Gong. The 610 office exists above Chinese law. Despite having no legal mandate, it's been given enormous financial resources. Reuters has compared the 610 office to the Nazi Gestapo, or secret police. The 610 office has deep ties to the Chinese police, labor camps, state-run media, the court system, schools and universities, and even Chinese embassies around the world, directing them to carry out the Communist Party's persecution of Falun Gong. For nearly 23 years, the 610 office has been responsible for the mass surveillance, arrest, detention, and torture of millions of Falun Gong practitioners in China. The United States Congress and other members of the international community have repeatedly demanded that the Chinese government put an end to the 610 office. And when Jiang Zemin said to, said to, in his words, eradicate Falun Gong, um, Ben, please give us an idea about what exactly that meant. How did he and his people go about that? Well, they're still still going about it, um, but his direct quote is to defame their reputations, bankrupt them financially, and destroy them physically. So that it's not a secret. That was his game plan. That is that is what what they're doing, right? They defame their reputations is an important one to to go on because it doesn't just happen in China; it happens outside of China. The first thing they had to do is turn the public against Falun Gong, which wasn't easy, right? A hundred million people practicing—that's one out of every thirteen people in China. Everyone knew someone practicing. So the first thing they did is, you know, what is the party good at? They're good at propaganda and persecution. And so the first was propaganda. And unfortunately, that, that part has even stuck in the West. Um, and then as far as bankrupt them financially, that's pretty self-explanatory. Get them fired from their jobs, leave them destitute, leave them homeless, leave them, you know, without anything. Um, and then the last thing is destroy them physically. That means to uh, illegally detain them to torture them, often to death. Horrible. Um, for those of you just who just tuned in, this is a live coverage of the 2022 World Falun Dafa Day in New York City. As you can see, there's thousands of Falun Gong practitioners out on the streets today. Um, like mentioned, in, since 1999, Falun Gong has been severely persecuted in China. And what we're seeing at the moment are banners that basically call for an end to these atrocities. We saw them passing earlier, they're still passing right now. And our infield reporter, Chenny Wu, is following along at the moment, and she is now joined by Ariel Liu. She lost her mother because of the persecution that's been going on for 23 years now. Chenny, let's hear her story now. Hi, Thanks, Chenny. Thanks, Evelyn. Here with me today is Ariel Liu. Back in 2017, her mother was taken away by the CCP police, and Ariel didn't even know until days after. Ariel, can you tell me what it was like when you first found out? Yeah, I was actually at a loss. Um, I didn't know what to make of it. 
but I was not、uh, too afraid at first because I was told that my mother was sent to a legal education center. I didn't know what it was, but it sounds just like somewhere people learn knowledge about the law. But I soon became extremely worried、um, after I did some online research because I found that this、uh, so-called legal education center was actually a brainwashing center established to persecute Falun Gong practitioners. There are many such brainwashing centers in China,、uh, where Falun Gong practitioners are、uh, tortured and being forced to give up their faith. And many people were persecuted to death or became disabled. So, could you tell me, was your mother different before and after she was taken? Yeah, she was a complete different person. My mother was a very light-hearted and outgoing person.、Uh, she was a teacher and she really loved kids. But after she was released, she became very fearful and depressed.、Um, she lost about 33 pounds. She became、um, she couldn't fall asleep at night, and she kept、uh, shaking uncontrollably. And her hearing and vision gradually degenerated, and she finally、um, passed away three years after she was released. I'm so sorry, Ariel. Did your mother, before she passed away, ever share with you exactly what she experienced? Yeah, she told me something like、uh, she was forced to sit in a classroom for about 15 to 16 hours a day,、uh, listening to the propaganda slander- slandering Falun Gong on a very high volume, and she was given very little food, and she was constantly threatened and intimidated. And most importantly, I believe she was、uh, secretly given poisonous drugs by the guards because her、uh, symptoms were very similar to those、uh, practitioners who were given poisonous drugs. And it's actually very common in these brainwashing centers to put poisonous drugs in Falun Gong practitioners' food. So, Ariel, do you feel resentment towards the people that did this to your mother? I actually asked myself the same question, but the answer is no, because I believe many of them they were just、uh, deceived by CCP's propaganda. They don't know that Falun Gong practitioners are actually very good people. So I don't hate them. I hope they can learn the truth. And for those who actually know the truth but still actively participate in the persecution. I think they lack the basic humanity and cannot be viewed as human beings. So it's not worth it to hate them. Thank you, Ariel, for sharing your story with us today, Evelyn. That's absolutely heartbreaking.、Um, why don't more people talk about this? That's a deep. That's a deep question.、Um, I'm sorry. I'm just still a little emotional from Ariel's I story. I feel the、uh, same way. Absolutely. Yeah, like I've been doing、believe. this for 15 years, and、uh, yeah, that's、uh, pretty heavy.、Um, you know, there's a lot of reasons that、uh, that information has been slow to get out of China about the persecution of Falun Gong, and there's other reasons why perhaps people don't talk about it as much. The persecution has been going on for over 20 years, but. The Chinese Communist Party, you know, within China, iron fist, right? Control state media. It's it's even hard to imagine as a Westerner. So, but outside of China, they have unbelievable influence as well. For instance, the United States Department of Justice does a study where they look at the foreign newspapers that are state-run by China. How much money do they pay American media? So, for instance, China Daily, which is a you know a CCP propaganda. It's the the English mouthpiece of the party. They paid 19 million dollars to U.S.、Uh, newspapers between 2016 and 2020. So they do this study every four years. DOJ. They paid 19 million dollars to the top. If I name these organizations, I don't want to. I don't want to do that right now. But they are the most. If you name four newspapers in the U.S., the top four, they've they've taken money from the Chinese Communist Party. So that's the money we know about. And so when you think about why isn't this being reported, I would ask what if that's the money we know about that's publicly reported. What about things we don't know about? What about business ties with China? You know, the Chinese Communist Party has a lot of influence, and I think you, you can't rely necessarily on the media to tell to tell the story. We have not been able to rely on the media to tell the story enough. So it really requires, I think,、uh, people you know that are watching this, that are seeing this parade, to to keep talking about it. Right, and、um, 
as the parade was going by, we saw a bunch of banners that basically asked for a stop um, of the persecution. And there are serious allegations coming out um, now, telling, uh, saying that China is forcibly taking, like taking organs out of living people to sell them for money, and that's really where it gets really grim because um, there is reports that show that China harvests these organs. Not um, you told me earlier that these people are not brain dead, not anything. They literally kill them to sell these um, sell these organs. So why? Don't you jump in here and tell me more about what you know about this? Yeah, so I think the first thing is as a Westerner, and I think the Western audience that's watching, uh, I think Chris said it pretty well. When uh, and uh, there's a Freedom House senior reporter or senior researcher, Sarah Cook, she said, that, you know, the CCP operates more like a mafia. So when you think about the Chinese Communist Party, you can't think about them in light of anything you know about governments or normal human behavior. They have no conscience whatsoever. They showed that throughout their reign, killing maybe upwards of 100 million people of their own people during the Cultural Revolution. So, you know, when we talk about live organ harvesting, the, the, the simple definition is that it's state-sponsored, meaning by the Chinese Communist Party, to harvest organs from prisoners of conscience to fuel a booming organ transplant business. So basically meaning they harvest organs from people and they sell those organs. So this is horrid and almost too grim for people to believe at first, right? It seems unbelievable. Like, how could this be happening? Some, sur surely somebody would be doing something about this. But the reality is that, um, the reality is we have to examine the evidence and the evidence suggests that the number of organs that the like because all this is public record right so the the discrepancy between the amount of transplants that have happened since 1999 around 1999 2000 and where those organs came from is completely unexplained like you could in the early 2000s and up until even later you could literally go on a website and it was almost like you know i don't mean to be grim here but organ e-commerce you could look and you could you could, you could pick out what you wanted, you could see a price, you could fly to China and within a week you could have that organ. How is that possible? How, like in, in the United States it takes how long? Like could take months, could take years. So where are these large amount of donors coming from, right? That's, that's the question we have to ask. Right, and I have an interesting report here by a state-run news source in China and uh, I think it's important to note that this is two years before the tribunal in London actually concluded that there was forced organ harvesting in China going on. So these, the, uh, this report is from two years before the allegations came out. And here's what it said in the China Daily, that only 34 Chinese citizens, 34, chose to donate their organs after death in 2010. And that is when China first launched a, a donation system. But then in 2016, it says more than 220,000 Chinese people have expressed a wish to donate organs after death. That's according to the donor registry. So with what you know about this issue, does that ring yeah, any alarm Yeah, so I mean, I mean, first is that I'm not sure we should take uh, any statistics from the Chinese Communist Party at face value. I think people out there should, should do their research. And, the reality is that, you know, just last week the UK passed a resolution condemning forced organ harvesting in China. That's something the United States government has done. That's something that every major organization in the world recognizes that this is happening. You, you mentioned the China Tribunal. They went through weeks and months of testimony and concluded that organ harvesting, forced organ harvesting is happening and it's happening to Falun Gong practitioners. So there's, there's not a debate anymore that this has happened and seems to be continuing happening. I think when we look at the numbers, I mean, even using their numbers, so 34 people volunteered in 2010. Let's go back. Let's go back to when all this started. Surprisingly, all these transplants through military hospitals, the CCP built these large military hospitals, this all started in the early 2000s. So it's very strange, right? If these came from death row inmates or other sources, they obviously didn't come from donations, right? Because you had 34 in 2010, assuming that's the similar number. They don't have enough death row inmates to even support this, but even assuming that they they had them, why does this all of a sudden start when Falun Gong practitioners are being imprisoned by the millions, right? It starts in 1999, 2000, 2001. It doesn't start in the 1980s or the early 90s. There's no, there's no death row transplant industry, right? It starts when you have 100 million people that you can grab off the street that are healthy and that you can throw in a basement somewhere in a military hospital and that nobody can ask questions about. That's when it starts. So I think people have to ask, like, what is one plus one here, you know? Yeah. 
Um, and I, I would love to explore this more um, because it's such an interesting topic, but I, we have to move on to the next section and we see that um, there are people holding flags that translate into quit the com Chinese Communist Party. And according, this is actually a movement, according to this movement's website, more than 395 million people have already quit the party. Why is this so, so important to quit the party to have a movement? Yeah, I think it's, it's very symbolic in China. You know, when you're, when you're in China and you're like a kid, you have to join the Young Pioneers. And then maybe you join the Communist Youth League and when you jo or the Communist Party later. And when you join these organizations, it's like very kind of sadistic in a way. It's like joining, it's, they're basically a cult. You have to pledge your life to the party. And so, you know, you're pledging your life to the party that's, again, we just covered doing forced organ harvesting, you know, persecuting people. So then you're on that side. Right, so you support that. And so, you know, this movement is really a, a symbolic and very important movement for the Chinese people to have a voice to say, I'm Chinese, I believe in China, but I do not believe in the Chinese Communist Party. I do not side with what they're doing. It's very, very important um, to get this out because the Chinese people don't have a voice in China. This is almost like amplifying and giving them a voice to say what they truly feel. Right. Um and as you can see, the parade is actually slowly coming to an end, and so is our broadcast. But I just want to go back really quick before we end this um, and go back to the grassroots movements that we see here going on. We see people signing petitions. We see people um, you know, right, uh, raising awareness about what is going on in China. And I just want to hear from you, you know, what more can we do as people outside of China? Yeah, I think in the West, it's really, really important that people talk about this. Whenever China's brought up, it's very odd, right? You have people doing forced organ harvesting, but yet you can buy a product from China. You can fly there. It's very kind of surreal. When China's brought up, we really need to be bringing up forced organ harvesting. And I, I would also encourage Westerners, there's a lot of propaganda in the West around Falun Gong and its teachings. And this, the Chinese Communist Party uses words like cult, for instance. It's a label they put on right in 1999. Uh, to try to describe so that people in the West feel strange or they're like, hey, I don't know if I want to stand up for Falun Gong. But I've explained what Falun Gong is. You practice, you don't practice, nobody asks you for money. It's definitely not a cult, right? You see these people, peaceful people in the park. So, you know, I think people can't, can't bend into that and Westerners need to stand up and talk about what's wrong because people don't have a voice in China and we need to be their voice. Right, um, I think that's a great way to end this, so let's leave it at that. And I hope that really one day things for Falun Gong practitioners and of course other minority groups in China will get much, much better. Uh, thank you, Ben Maloney from the Falun Dafa Information Center. Uh, and we have NTD News Today coming up here with Kevin Hogan at 12 p.m. Eastern, so stay tuned for that. But th that's all from me though. Uh, thank you very much for watching and have a wonderful weekend.